Hey everybody, Brett Etheridge here, founder of Dominate the GMAT, and in this video I want to look at a really important component of success on the GMAT, and in fact it's something that you may not even be aware of, and it may be the missing element that's keeping you from getting the score you need on the GMAT, despite the fact that I'm sure you've studied a lot and learned a lot of rules and formulas, but the missing ingredient may be the realization and understanding that the GMAT is a reasoning test. So what does that mean? I want to unpack that. I want to go through an example with you in this video, but it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that the GMAT is just a math test, right? If I just learn enough formulas, if I brush up on my high school math, I'll be okay. Or that even on the verbal side, it's just a grammar test, an English grammar test, or a reading comprehension test. But to succeed on the GMAT, do you think it might be helpful to understand what the GMAC, the makers of the GMAT, what the GMAT actually thinks it is, right? It doesn't matter what you think it is, what do they think it is? What are they trying to test? And they think it's a reasoning test. I was actually at a conference up in Reston, Virginia at the headquarters of the GMAC, the GMAC, the organization that actually creates and, and administers the GMAT. And they brought a bunch of us in and I was listening to a talk by the CEO, a kind of a behind the scenes peek of, of what goes into the GMAT and what their thinking is. And they said something very interesting that I want to share with you here. Take a look at the sections of the GMAT, as you see listed here. You're probably familiar with them, but during the CEO's talk, he flashed up a slide similar to this, and he pointed out something that really just kind of struck me, and that's what I wanted to share with you and go through an example. If you look at the four sections of the GMAT, what do you notice? Well, you have the analytical writing assessment. The word analytical becomes important there. But look at the other three sections. You have integrated reasoning. You have verbal reasoning, including, by the way, an explicit question type called critical reasoning. You have quantitative reasoning, right? So it's easy just to say, oh, the verbal section or the math section of the GMAT, but from the GMAC's perspective, it's not the verbal section, it's the verbal reasoning section. It's not the math section, it's the quantitative reasoning section. And the takeaway is that the GMAT is a reasoning test. So why is that important? Well, take a look at this example. This is a question that could very well appear on the GMAT or something like it, and yet it's not a simple, straightforward, explicit math question. You're not going to have a simple rule or a simple formula or just a simple thing that you can learn from you know, your high school math days that will enable you to answer this question. Instead, you have to come at it with a mindset that you have to reason your way to a right answer. So I'm going to give you a second to try that yourself, kind of put on the reasoning hat and see if you can get a right answer. And whether you can or you can't, either way, we'll come back and we'll talk about it together and I'll point out a few interesting things for you as we kind of wrap up this video, but go ahead and press pause, give this a try, and then we'll talk about it together. Okay, so how did you do? Again, it's not necessarily straightforward. Hopefully, maybe you got a breakthrough, and if you did, I think that's the mindset that I want you to adopt. If you come away from this video with nothing else, it's the understanding that if a question pops up on your screen on test day that maybe you don't immediately know how to attack, you don't freak out, you don't panic, you say, oh yeah, Brett said, ah, it's actually a reasoning test, hmm, can I come at it from a slightly different way and, and think creatively and reason my way to a right answer, right? So there's obviously a lot of stuff on the GMAT that has to do with exponents that you might have simple, straightforward rules for. We teach all of it in our courses, our, our algebra courses, our comprehensive uh, GMAT quantitative courses, and you need to learn those. But most of the rules for exponents have to do with multiplying or dividing exponents, right? You can either add or multiply the exponents together or subtract them if you're dividing exponents of the same base, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's most of our rules. We don't really have something clean and neat to do when we're subtracting or adding exponents. There is kind of an advanced technique where you can factor out exponents. So if you had something like 5 to the 5th minus 5 to the 4th, what do we do with that? Again, we don't really have a straightforward rule, uh, but we could factor out the common exponent, 5 to the 4th, that's common to both. 5 to the 4th goes into 5 to the 5th evenly with one left over, so that leaves a 5 to the 1st. Minus 5 to the 4th goes into 5 to the 4th evenly. So inside the parentheses, now we've kind of 
broken it down. That's a really cool technique. Five to the first is five, minus one is four. So the answer to this question is four times five to the fourth, five, 25, 125. So, you know, whatever that ends up being, 2,500, something like that. But we don't have something like that for this question. So what do we do? Well, one of the things I'm always telling my students is if you feel stuck and you don't know exactly what to do, you can't see the whole picture about how the question's going to unfold, do something. And maybe the reasoning will come along with it, right? All we care about is the units digit, right? Think back to the question itself. What is the units digit of the solution to this question? So I actually don't care what the whole answer is going to be, and it would be something too big. It's not going to be one, three, four, six, nine. I just care about the units digit, right? So I don't know, but like, let's start doing something. In other words, if I'm going to take 177 to the 28th power, that means I'm going to take 177 and I'm going to multiply it by itself, right? That would be, by the way, the first power, right? So the first power, um, sorry, the first power is just 177 to the first, which is just itself. And here's my question. What's the units digit of that? Well, the units digit, a math term that you may or may not know, is just the... Um, kind of the last number. If you have a two-digit number, a three-digit number, a 20-digit number, it's just, it's the last one. It's the ones digit, in other words, right? So for 177 to the first power, if that's all I had, uh, the units digit is just seven. Okay, so what if, what if I have 177 to the second power, right? And that's kind of the mindset. We want to start to do something. We want to reason our way to see what's going on here. I'm not going to do this 100 or 28 times, but maybe I can get an idea of how it's playing out. What's happening? What is there a pattern? And from that pattern, might I be able to reason my way to a right answer? So the units digit when the power is 1 is 7. What about when I square it? Well, I would have to do this long math. 7 times 7 is 49. 4, carry the 4. Oh. But like, I don't have to do that. I don't care about the rest of this stuff. I just know that when I multiply 177 times itself, the first thing you do is multiply the units digits together. It's 49, leaving a units digit of... Nine. Oh, interesting. Okay, now I'm on to something. So what if I take it to the third power by multiplying it by 177 again? Well, again, I don't care what the whole rest of this thing is. I just know I would start by taking the units digit nine times 177. I start by doing nine times seven is 63, carry the six. But again, I don't care about the rest of that stuff. The units digit there is three. Okay, so seven, nine, three, no pattern yet. Let's take it to the fourth power. If I multiply it by 177 again, seven times three is 21. So the units digit in that case would be one. Uh, if I did it again to the fifth power, um, one times seven would be seven. Oh, the pattern would then repeat, right? So every four powers, the unit's digit will start to repeat. Will that be useful if I try to figure out what the unit's digit will be at the 28th power? Yes, it will. And in fact, what would it be? And again, this takes a little bit of reasoning, right? So the first power would be seven, second would be nine, third would be three, fourth would be one, fifth would be seven, six, seven. Oh. So it repeats every four. How many times does four go into 28? the pattern will repeat seven times because four times seven is 28. In other words, it will go in perfectly. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, blah, 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 25, 26, 27, 28. So at the 28th power, the unit's digit will be one. So this outcome 177 to the 28th power will be something like really, 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 really big and long with one as the last number. Does that make sense? And now we have to do it again for 133 to the 23rd power. So let's kind of do the same thing. Let me change pen color. So maybe it's easier for you to kind of see the difference. So the first power, the units digit of that 
will be three. The second power, three times three would be nine. The unit's digit would be nine. The third power, so this is power. I, I think you get the idea of what we're doing at this point, right? This is the idea of reasoning. The third power would be nine times three is 27, carry the two, but the unit's digit will be seven. The fourth power would be seven um, times three is 21, so carry that. The fifth power would be one times three is three. Oh, there we go. It's gonna repeat again. It actually also repeats every four. Just coincidence, it's not the case that every time you do something like this, it will repeat you know, every four. Uh, but these just both happen to repeat four times. So what's the unit's digit gonna be at the 23rd power then? This is a little different, right? It doesn't go quite in evenly. Four times every, so the first two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up to 23, ah, well four will go into 20 evenly five times. So at 20, it will reset the 21st one will be a three, the 22nd one will be a nine, the 23rd one therefore will be the seven. So again, the outcome of this will be something really, 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 really long seven. The ultimate punchline then is what? That if I'm subtracting those things, I have something, something really, really, really long that ends in a one, minus something really, really, really long that ends in a seven, and if I were to subtract those, how do we do that? Well, we have to borrow from the tens column. Carry, so that's like 11 minus seven would be four, blah, 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 blah. So it leaves a final outcome of four. The unit's digit of this, the kind of the difference between those huge products would be four, answer choice C. So I hope you see that, man. That's kind of a long problem, a long way to get there. Uh, I hope you liked that solution. I hope you had some light bulbs go off. And the big takeaway, of course, is that even if you don't have simple, straightforward math, and sometimes you won't, your job is still to get a right answer. So this really kind of begs the question, how do you learn to reason? Can you learn to reason better, for example? How, like, what do we do? Well, kind of the first thing I would say is, just being exposed to more of these questions, whether you have a coach, whether you have a tutor, whether you take my course, seeing stuff kind of builds up your inventory of similar questions that you can pull from. Now that you've seen this, you should be able to do okay on any one of these types of questions that you see on the GMAT that has to do with units and digits because they all kind of work the same way. Forget the rest of the big stuff. Really all that matters is that units digit when it's multiplied. So you've seen it. You'll be able to take this kind of tool in your toolbox and apply it to similar questions in the future. So just exposure is one way to learn to reason better. Kind of the second thing is a lot of these strategies can be taught. I spend a lot of time in my course um, teaching what I call non-traditional or non-standard strategies for both math and verbal quantitative reasoning, like non-standard strategies, verbal strategies for verbal reasoning. So certainly encourage you to check out our courses if you really want to dominate the GMAT. Uh, and the third thing I think is just to be aware of it so that you don't panic. Because again, oftentimes a student will have a hard question pop up on the screen, and if you don't immediately have the formula, especially, you know, I work with uh, a lot of different types of students and engineers, maybe you're an engineer, or people from a more traditional math or science bath background actually have some of the hardest times on the GMAT, not because they don't know a lot of math and not because they're not really smart, but because they're so traditional in their approach, they're so formulaic, they want to go by the book. And that's not always what you have to do on certain questions. Some questions require you to reason your way to a right answer. And just being aware of that could make all the difference for you. So that when you're feeling stuck, you just say, ah, but I still have to get a right answer. Let me come at it from a slightly different way. It doesn't mean you'll always be able to do that. Uh, but I want you to practice it. I want you to take this new mindset into your preparation for the GMAT. And again, encourage you to head over to dominatethegmat.com. Check out our courses where we teach a lot of this stuff, guys. would love to work with you. would love to partner with you and empower you to dominate the GMAT. Uh, and with that, actually, I'd love to hear from you. Leave comments. Leave questions below. What did you like most about this? What, was, what did you find empowering? What maybe don't you still understand? What questions do you have about reasoning on the GMAT? Uh, would love to hear from you, so leave your comments below. And I will leave you with that now to get back to studying so that you can dominate the GMAT.